for our final session, we have again imported another individual, this time a man from Kansas by way of California. Is that about the way it should be, Bob? Yeah. So uh, just so you know the way he came here, we had just planned a final session where there might be some inspirational uh, presentation, and I think we got about the best person we could find for it. Last March, Lucille and I were visiting San Francisco for a principal's convention, and we planned to meet Vern and Nancy. They picked us up. We've been picked up before, but this was uh, rather unique in San Francisco, and they took us to their home, and I can see why he would have difficulty keeping down to a smaller weight because the meal that they presented was uh, quite something. We had a very enjoyable time with them, spent the evening in their book surrounded, I guess it's supposed to be a living room, but with all the books and the uh, electronic equipment, it was hard to know. But. Um, we did have a very enjoyable time with him out in Berkeley, <coughs> and at that time he agreed to come here today to speak. So we will have our Westerner, I guess you'd call him a preacher or a radio preacher, but much more a dispenser of the truths of the Urantia book and uh, for his final message, he has wished it to be entitled, So Send I You. His official name over the radio is Vern Benham Grinsley. So Vern, and So Send I You. Thank you, Alvin Leslie Kulicki. <laughs> I talked to your wife just before you came <laughs> Before I speak this afternoon, may we together share a moment of silence in which to seek the Father's purposes. Thank you. When Jesus and the apostles were encamped at Magadan, they trained 70 evangelists to go forth proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom throughout Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And on page 1806, those 70 evangelists are described, and I quote, as enthusiasts for the gospel of the kingdom. This is the Urantia book's fundamental definition or description of evangelism. It is enthusiasm for the gospel of the kingdom. That word enthusiasm comes from the Greek an and theos, meaning God within, and evangelism from the root Evangelion, meaning to bear glad tidings. On page 1598, Jesus says, simply go forth proclaiming. This is the kingdom of heaven. God is your father and you are his sons. And this good news, if you wholeheartedly believe it, is your eternal salvation. On page 1805, Jesus, again emphasizing proclamation, says, Proclaim a spiritual brotherhood of the sons of God. On page 1931, Jesus says, You are to be valiant in defense of righteousness, mighty in the promulgation of truth, and aggressive in the preaching of this gospel of the kingdom even to the ends of the earth. On page 2049, Jesus says, If you would obey me, go then into the lands of the Gentiles 
and proclaim this gospel. There is but one law to obey. That is the command, to go forth proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. On page 2052, Jesus says, That which the world needs most to know is men are the sons of God, and through faith they can actually realize and daily experience this ennobling truth. On page 1432, we read that Jesus and Gainad marveled at this great lighthouse in Pharos of Alexandria, and that Jesus challenged this lad to become a living lighthouse of spiritual truth in his own native India when he returned. On page 1930, we read that Jesus and the apostles are encamped near Gethsemane, and Jesus says, and I quote, the persistent preaching of this gospel of the kingdom will one day bring to all nations a new and unbelievable liberation, intellectual freedom, and religious liberty. And on page 2043, Jesus declares, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. In the promulgation of spiritual truth, there are fundamentally two aspects, actions and words. And to fail in these is probably to make very little impact at all. As that elderly woman complained of the new young preacher in her town, six days of the week he's invisible, the seventh he's incomprehensible. As Urantians, our religion needs both to be visible and comprehensible, but it isn't enough that it only be visible. We need also to talk about, to proclaim, to declare these majestic and soul-transforming truths proclaimed cover to cover in this magnificent book. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the liberty, the renewal, of this majestic message. This was the challenge of Jesus. As the Father sent me into the world, said Jesus, so send I you. Now Jesus' own method of teaching was not only wondrously lucid, but it was furthermore refreshingly relevant. For example, Jesus could have said, the anachronicity of venerable theological constructs is incompatible with the ongoing viability of contemporary existential mandates. He could have said that, but fortunately, instead, he said, don't put new wine in old wineskins, they'll burst, or bust, for those of us from Kansas. <laughs> Jesus had the genius to proclaim spiritual truth simply, and in an age when the great temptation is for us to be so sophisticated that we feel we have to obfuscate and complicate this simple message, Jesus called us to the most elementary kind of proclamation of this good news of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. There is power in this. In his writings, the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid described an axiom as a self-evident truth. One example of one of Euclid's axioms would be, if equal quantities are added to equal quantities, the results will be equal. Most people, simply upon hearing that, without even testing it or trying it in a laboratory, will automatically agree that it's true. But are there not also spiritual axioms, statements so alive, so vitally vibrant with spiritual truth that people, simply upon hearing them, find themselves being stirred by them? Man cannot live by bread alone. Do to others as you would have them do to you, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And our challenge is to share the exhilarating excitement of the discovery of spiritual truth and share that with our brothers in this planetary family of God. Ancient man would freely share his fire. If a neighbor's hearth went out, he would loan a burning brand or an ember, knowing that fire has the ability to replenish itself. He wasn't really depriving himself. So it is with spiritual truth. It has the ability to augment, to increase by the very act of sharing. For example, suppose two men are walking along down the street. And each one stops, gives the other a dollar bill. 
Each man walks away with only one dollar. But if they meet on the street, two men, and they talk, and each one gives the other a spiritual truth, each man then walks away with two spiritual truths. Spiritual things multiply by sharing, and as we read on page 557 in Morancha Mota, knowledge is possessed only by sharing. I have yet to meet the automobile dealer, the Republican, Democrat, Socialist, or perhaps on the Berkeley campus, Communist even, who is at all hesitant to tell anybody else about his belief or defend his particular ideology. Why then should we be at all hesitant to proclaim, as Jesus called us to, this majestic message and live this forth in our lives. It's a twofold matter, action and words. By the sheer fact of being interested in something, we have the ability to interest other people in it too. For example, any one of us could go out here on diversity, stand on a corner, and begin looking fixedly up into the sky. And you know that before very long, a little crowd of people would gather and they'd all begin looking up in the sky too, Something about human nature indicates this will happen. Even if we're not looking at a single thing, people are going to stop and look up. Why? Simply because we're interested. The power of being interested in something has the ability to interest other people in it, too, even if they're not sure what it is you're interested in. And in the same sense, this power of enthusiastic interest in these majestic, life-transforming spiritual truths has the ability to spill over at the brim, and other people sense this, too. Real religion is best spread by those who possess it, or perhaps more accurately, those who are possessed by it. If I may illustrate somewhat gruesomely but graphically, the best way to give somebody else the Asiatic flu, measles, mumps, or the five-day common cold is to have it yourself. And the same with this sharing of spiritual truth. If we ourselves are living this, in the liberation and the joy of being sons and daughters of this living God, other people are going to sense this about us and are going to ask. We are, as Jesus said, going to whet people's appetites for this spiritual truth. You become like the fellow who took so many penicillin shots every time he sneezed, he cured somebody. <laughs> we can begin a veritable spiritual epidemic, I believe, on this planet. Or, as the Urantia book refers to it, a planetary spiritual renaissance of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Christie likes to talk about spiritual fragrance, this ability to whet people's appetites for truth. I remember back in my hometown of Garden City, Kansas, one time a few years ago, a young man opened up what he called a spud nut shop. Now, maybe you've never seen a spud nut. It was a donut only made with potato flour instead of with wheat flour. Nobody thought he'd do particularly well. But then nobody knew the exact technique or tactic he had in mind because this fellow installed right in the kitchen there where he was going to fry those spud nuts over the stove a huge exhaust fan. And he blew this tantalizing aroma of those frying spud nuts out there onto the street. And you could smell it for a half block either direction. You couldn't drive by that place in your car with the windows rolled up, post-nasal drip, and smoking a cigar without catching a whiff of those <laughs> spud nuts frying there on the stove. As the saying goes, sometimes a really great product has the ability to sell itself. And if we are living with this overflowing, zesty, exhilarating joy of knowing we're sons and daughters of God, of knowing we're living in one family, the family of God, that we're brothers on this planet, making increased contact with this indwelling adjuster, certain of eternal life, with a faith, and heeding that greatest of all challenges, to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, other people sense this. There is a spiritual fragrance about it. By the words we speak and by the things we do, we can be evangelists, as the Urantia book defines it, enthusiasts for the gospel of the kingdom. For as Jesus said, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. And again he said, from those to whom much has been given, much will be required. Any one of us could go down and stand in a crosswalk again on diversity, 
And if you notice, when people are stopped, waiting for a red light to turn green, time and time again I've seen this happen. If one person will step off to walk against that red light on either side of the intersection, almost inevitably, impulsively, somebody else will step off to follow him. Now, that other person may immediately come to his senses, retreat back to the curb again at once, but his first impulse was to follow. There is an unspoken, wordless leadership in what we do, the very styles by which we live our lives. The loyalties which we hold become apparent in this lifestyle, in our actions, as we live by faith as sons and daughters of this living God. And that, too, is evangelism. Professor Raymond G. Carey has written in the Scientific Review of Religious Research that as a result of his psychological studies, he's found people who daily engage in prayer, meditation, and worship are statistically, measurably happier people than those who do not, referring to two test groups he tested. Now even psychology is beginning to understand that there's something going on in this realm of spiritual endeavor in man's religion, his quest after supreme ideals. And you'll recall, this is the very definition on one occasion on page 1100 that a Melchizedek gives of religion. True religion is a wholehearted devotion to some reality which the religionist deems to be of supreme value to himself and for all mankind. That last phrase, and for all mankind, again comes back to the evangelistic or the sharing impulse, that we not stand here with full cups, but let our cups run over and share this majestic spiritual truth. Back in medieval Germany, oftentimes Bibles, devotional manuals, prayer books, were made with a little leather loop at the very top so that a man could wear that book right on his belt when he went out to go about his business. Try that with a Urantia book and you'll spring your buckle. But, <laughs> but with smaller volumes, it seems to have worked quite well. I like the symbolism of that because it depicts religion as something that we don't leave at home, but something we take with us. Indeed, more importantly, we take it within us. This love, this simple love of God and man, this life-transforming and ultimately world-transforming gospel message which Jesus came proclaiming and then which he challenged us again and again, which he challenged us to proclaim. On page 2086 in the Urantia book, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man are described as the greatest truth that mortal man can ever hear. Now, oftentimes the Urantia book will make powerful statements, but will qualify them in some way. Here it's saying the greatest truths that mortal man can ever hear are this living gospel of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. If it's that good, maybe we ought to do something individually about proclaiming it. It's exciting, this joy of being evangelists in the sense the Urantia book describes them, enthusiasts for the gospel of the kingdom. And again, as Christie has mentioned, not just being concerned with the selling of books, but the sharing of this spiritual truth. Not only the book itself, but more importantly, what's inside this thrilling and exhilarating spiritual content for which so many people are craving. People are becoming tired of a second-hand religion, or they ought to be. Now, for example, I'm about some six feet, four inches tall. Suppose I went into a movie theater sat down in front of somebody, it was a comedy picture, and the person tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, I can't see. And I turned around and said, well, never mind, just keep your eye on me and laugh whenever I do. <laughs> he wouldn't be particularly thrilled about the whole idea, I'm sure. We're not content to watch a motion picture secondhand. Why should we be content to have our religion secondhand? I think more and more people are craving after a firsthand faith, the experience of spiritual discovery, of finding that we are sons and daughters of God, daring to believe this and live this way in faith, and discovering the joy, the peace, the profound new sense of power there is in living as sons and daughters of God and with loyalty to these supreme values. The sharing of this kind of truth is such an exciting thing, really. It's an adventure. Someone may have mentioned that 
We have a radio broadcast, which is on seven stations, and uh, we're dealing with the basic message of the Urantia book in this. Every once in a while, I will get a letter or a phone call from somebody saying, why do you keep talking about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man over and over again? You keep reiterating this. And I sometimes respond with the Grimsley terrible parable uh, about the certain little boy who was called up in front of the class one day. He was attending a little one-room country school. The teacher called him up to her desk and said, Now, I just finished reading this essay you turned in about your dog. She said, I read this over, and I knew it rang a bell, and I checked it, and it's word for word the same essay your brother turned in last year. The boy said, Yeah, same dog. <laughs> And why are we again and again challenged to reiterate the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man? Because that's the fundamental message Jesus was proclaiming, and it's thrilling. But we don't have to do it in a funereal, a dour-faced kind of way. As Jesus said one time, we're not supposed to be colorless ascetics. We're the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. With a zest for life and for knowing God as this Father, and knowing this infinite love of this infinite God, and then sharing this with our brothers. And we can use a sense of humor in that, too. You ever hear about Jim Daly? This was a man who in Dublin, Ireland, some years ago, one morning was in a pub, and he made a bet with somebody that within one day he could make up a nonsense word and within the period of only one day, he could get all the city of Dublin talking about that imaginary word before sunset. Somebody took him up on the bet. And he won it. You know how he won it? He hired all the little boys he could, gave them each a piece of chalk, and he had them write that nonsense word that he'd made up all over town, on every fence, on the sidewalk, on the sides of buildings and so forth, and by the end of the day, all of Dublin was talking about it. And what was that word? Q-U-I-Z, quiz. And it's now in our dictionary. Originally, it meant to play a practical joke. Now it means to ask questions. By sheer creativity, ingenuity, and furthermore, a kind of sense of humor, one Irishman got a whole city talking about, in the space of one day, a nonsense word that he'd made up that morning. Why should we then? Be at all hesitant about sharing these majestic spiritual truths, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, for said Jesus, as the Father sent me into the world, so send I you. Jesus' own techniques of whetting people's appetites for spiritual truth were most interesting. For example, on page 1430, we read, one of the young men who worked with Jesus one day on the steering paddle became much interested in the words which he dropped from hour to hour as they toiled in the shipyard. A technique of evangelism, dropping words from hour to hour while he was on the job. Or again, on page 1570, Jesus says, You are not now as men among men, but as the enlightened citizens of another and heavenly country among the ignorant creatures of this dark world. This was quoted to us earlier. It is not enough that you live as you were before this hour, but henceforth must you live as those who have tasted the glories of a better life and have been sent back to earth as ambassadors of the sovereign of that new and better world. And on the next page, 1571, discern the truth clearly, live the righteous life fearlessly, and so shall you be my disciples and apostles in my Father's ambassadors. You have heard it said, if the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the pit. If you would guide others into the kingdom, you must yourselves walk in the clear light of living truth. Again, 1592. Jesus is talking to Simon. He says, Simon, how many times have I instructed you to refrain from all efforts to take something out of the hearts of those who seek salvation? How often have I told you to labor only to put something in? to these hungry souls. On 1593, says Jesus endeavored to make clear that he desired his disciples, having tasted of the good spirit realities of the kingdom, so to live in the world that men, by seeing their lives, would become kingdom conscious 
and hence be led to inquire of believers concerning the ways of the kingdom. On page 1608, today the unbelievers may taunt you with preaching a gospel of non-resistance and with living lives of non-violence, but you are the first volunteers of a long line of sincere believers in the gospel of this kingdom who will astonish all mankind by their heroic devotion to these teachings. No armies of the world have ever displayed more courage and bravery than will be portrayed by you and your loyal successors, who shall go forth into all the world proclaiming the good news, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. On 1681, it says, The next evening, having gathered together the twelve apostles, the apostles of John and the newly commissioned women's group, Jesus said, You see for yourselves that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Let us all, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he send forth still more laborers into his field. And I believe there are many of us here this afternoon feeling a stirring call to this challenge Jesus issued forth, the proclamation of these spiritual truths. Again and again and again in this book, that challenge is issued. On page 1725, we read that Jesus said, You who have professed entrance into the kingdom of heaven are altogether too vacillating and indefinite in your teaching conduct. The heathen, he said, strike directly for their objectives. You are guilty of too much chronic yearning. If you desire to enter the kingdom, why do you not take it by spiritual assault, even as the heathen take a city they lay siege to? You are hardly worthy of the kingdom when your service consists so largely in an attitude of regretting the past, whining over the present, and vainly hoping for the future. Why do the heathen rage, he said? Because they know not the truth. Why do you languish in futile yearning? Because you obey not the truth. Cease your useless yearning and go forth bravely doing that which concerns the establishment of the kingdom. Another time, on 1780, Rodin of Alexandria says, if something has become a religion in your experience, it is self-evident that you already have become an active evangel of that religion since you deem the supreme concept of your religion as being worthy of the worship of all mankind. And then listen to this very thought-provoking sentence. Rodin says, if you are not a positive and missionary evangel of your religion, you are self-deceived in that what you call a religion is only a traditional belief or a mere system of intellectual philosophy. Rodin here is saying that if we're not evangelists, we're really not religionists. Again, evangelists in this best sense, not in the worst sense. I think sometimes we think of that fellow who was stomping around all over the platform, waving his arms like a semaphore flagsman, yelling and telling everyone to flee from the wrath to come. That one evangelist, he cried out, in that last final day there will be weeping and there will be wailing and there will be the gnashing of teeth. One little old lady stood up in the back and said, but sir, I have no teeth. Madam, he roared, teeth will be provided. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so again and again, when we use this word evangelism, and when it's used in the book, it's referring rather to enthusiasm for the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what it means. Once again, Jesus says on 1931, you are not to be passive mystics or colorless ascetics. You should not become dreamers and drifters, supinely trusting in a fictitious providence. Remember, he said that you are commissioned to preach this gospel of the kingdom, the supreme desire to do the Father's will, coupled with the supreme joy of faith realization of sonship with God. And again, on this very same subject, if I may go back, to the history of Urantia, we read this. And nearly 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus, the third and final article in the creed, which was memorized by the followers of Melchizedek of Salem, read as follows. This was Melchizedek's creed. It said, I promise to obey the seven commandments of Melchizedek and to tell the good news of this covenant with the Most High to all men. Each follower of Melchizedek was thus to be an evangelist, even as Jesus commissioned his apostles, not only his apostles, but his disciples as well, you find in the resurrection appearances, to go forth into all the world and proclaim this gospel of the kingdom 
the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. There's a yearning, there is an intense craving for this. I know on the Berkeley campus I find so many young people longing for some sense of meaning, purpose in life. Many a young man in his 20s has made up his mind to change the world, but then decided it would be easier to change his mind than the world and has. But one of the challenges in the teachings of Jesus, I believe, is that of maintaining this spiritual idealism, this high sense of spiritual purpose, which we can feel, and then sharing and proclaiming this spiritual truth to those who are craving for it, who are longing for it. Now, this isn't just a matter of winning arguments, but winning people. It is not merely winning arguments about God, but winning people to God. You ever noticed when you're listening to the sort of pompously pious person who declares with great earnestness that he would go to the very ends of the earth for his religion, that you begin secretly wishing that perhaps he would and possibly stay there? <laughs> That's not the kind of evangelism Jesus was talking about, but rather the overflow of the joy in our lives of knowing we're sons and daughters of God and the fact that this is simply infectious. This is catching, and people have a craving for this. And time and again, this commission is given, for from those to whom much has been given, much will be required. I recall one time back in Berkeley, my wife and I were sitting at a little out-of-doors Italian cafe, having a pizza, as I recall, between us on the table there. And down the sidewalk, there came a shabby, old man shuffling along on a cane. And I'll never forget, for one fleeting instant, as he walked by, that furtive, longing look as he went by and saw that pizza there on the table between us. I'll never forget that because, in a sense, I think I see that look in the eyes of young and old alike everywhere. It's the look of another man's hunger watching me eat. Only now I'm not talking about physical hunger, but spiritual longing and craving. In men and women, boys and girls, a yearning and a longing after spiritual truth. And you and I are commissioned to dare to proclaim this spiritual truth, to go into all the world and announce this message of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and live this out ourselves. But again, we can do it with creativity and humor. One time a fellow was walking along down the street, went past a hardware store, saw a big sign there in the window. It said, Fishing Tickle. Not Fishing Tackle, but Fishing Tickle, T-I-C-K-L-E. So he walked into the store, went up to the man, the proprietor, behind the counter. He said, Say, that sign you have out there in your window, he said, it says, Fishing Tickle. It's misspelled. Hasn't anybody ever told you about that? The fellow said, Yes. He said, Lots of people have told me about it, but I notice every time they come in, they almost always spend something. <laughs> Now, if a merchant can use that much creative ingenuity just to get people into his store, we can use some creative ingenuity to lead people into spiritual truth and the joy of it. And the words we speak can be so crucially important. I think sometimes we downplay the importance of our words, of the ability of words of truth, which again and again Jesus insisted that we emphasize and reiterate the ability of these words of truth to stir people to an awareness of this truth. There is power in words. For example, I could stand before this assemblage right now, and if I wanted to, for some perverse or sadistic reason, I could begin describing, say, a backyard barbecue with beef swimming in barbecued sauce and perhaps hot apple pie, salad, and so forth and so forth. And before long, just by the sheer power of words, you would probably begin salivating. If words... Sheer words coming from somebody's vocal cords and out of somebody's mouth can bring about very graphic and measurable physiological responses in us. Then think the power that words of spiritual truth have in the lives of other people. They have a life transformative power, and for this reason, again and again, we are commissioned, we are challenged to go forth into all the world and preach this message or proclaim it and live it and dare to talk about it 
dare to talk about it because there are people around each one of us sometimes we would not suspect in a hundred years that there's a person there really craving for spiritual truth longing to find God and yet maybe we're riding next to that person on a bus or a subway or perhaps we meet that person in an elevator every day this might be a person craving now of course we have to use wisdom and discernment one of the great missions in proclaiming spiritual truth is I believe helping people to attain an awareness of the presence of God to become aware of this I remember the first apartment my wife Nancy and I had I'm not saying that place was small but if you were standing in the living room and you wanted to go into the kitchen or the den or the bedroom you just kept standing in the living room <laughs> wherever you wanted to go you were more than likely there already isn't it likewise true that for a person to say that he wants to find God is like saying he wishing he were in the living room when in fact he's already standing in the living room that we are in the presence of God because the presence of God is within us a fragment of infinity this thought adjuster this spirit and to help people become aware of this is a thrilling thing I believe there is no higher privilege than leading another person to God to a sense of higher spiritual truth not again in a phony or a corny or a reprehensible way or dourly but as a sense of sharing as if you had too much pizza on your plate and here here's some more or evangelism is perhaps one beggar telling another beggar where to find food but this sense of sharing about it as Jesus challenged called and commissioned us to for as Jesus said as the father sent me into the world so send I you I'll never forget the English teacher back in prep school who first got me really excited about great poetry and his technique was not at all mysterious it consisted very simply of the fact that he himself was so excited about great poetry this man a long lanky fellow used to stand before that class and hold us spellbound with the sheer wonder of words as he stood reciting Shakespeare Keats and Shelley and we would listen and we came to love it because because he loved it so that man had become a preacher he could have converted even a professor of theology I dare say so great was his power it was his enthusiasm for it and it was catching and we began to see there was something about which to be enthusiastic this was the power of him and I think this must have been something the power of Simon Peter and something of the power of Jesus this overwhelming overrunning overflowing sense of the joy of knowing God and if by faith we know this we can be used for mighty purposes we can be used as the earthly fulcra for the spiritual leverage which is going to transform this very world Henry Ward Beecher the old preacher back in Civil War days used to say that when a congregation is going to sleep during a sermon you shouldn't send around an usher to wake the people up that used to be the custom I guess they'd come around with a pole and poke people but Beecher used to say if the congregation is going to sleep on you you shouldn't send around an usher to wake the people up you ought to send the usher up there to the pulpit and wake the preacher up because he's the one who's dozing in the same sense if we're really alive and vitally vibrant and filled with the joy of knowing these spiritual truths not in a holier-than-thou kind of way but in the sense of here is a great joy here is a great peace here is a great sense of purpose a new meaning for life in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man in the discovery of these thrilling and transcendent truths which we are called and commissioned to share with all mankind I read the story of a medical surgeon in India who on one occasion performed a cataract operation on a man and cured him of blindness some time later this surgeon was looking off down the road and he saw a long procession of 47 blind men and women walking along that road each one holding on to a long rope staggering and stumbling along and there at the very front of that rope and holding the end of it was that first man 
whose sight he had restored. Now that's evangelism. It is the sharing of spiritual truth, as Jesus called us to. I believe it's the most exciting thing I can contemplate in terms of what this planet needs, the need for a spiritual renaissance, or as Jesus said on 2052, that which the world needs most to know is men are the sons of God, and through faith they can actually realize and daily experience this ennobling truth. Here is a, I believe, powerfully provocative point. But this is one which I've pondered at considerable length, that in my repeated readings of the Urantia book, I have yet to come across one single place where the Urantia book commissions us to go forth into all the world proclaiming the Urantia book. But I have come across nearly 100 very clear places where the Urantia book commissions us to go forth into all the world proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man. This was, is, and I believe yet remains the primal priority of this revelation, the bringing about of a spiritual renaissance on this troubled, perturbed planet of ours. And I firmly believe that every person in this room, and I'll even count the people in this room too, and you back in the hall, <laughs> each one of us, has a part to play in this. We are mortal select men in the sense that so much has been given to us. And each one of us has unique talents and unique contributions to make to this mighty venture of bringing about a spiritual renaissance on this planet. And I know not what the Father would have you do and be, but whatever it is, it will be good. And it will be important. And I know of no privilege higher than that of sharing spiritual truth and leading others to a consciousness of God, to the love of God and man, the recognition of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Many a man is born on this earth, lives his lifetime, dies. And then the lawyers, the courts, his family, all begin the work of settling his will. And this is considered to be an extremely important responsibility, almost a humanly sacred matter, dealing with the execution of a man's last will and testament here on earth. And yet some 2,000 years ago, one Jesus of Nazareth declared in his final resurrection appearance that his last request before, literally, before he ascended, before he vanished physically from the face of this earth, was that his gospel be proclaimed, and I quote, to the uttermost parts of the world, to the uttermost parts of the world. And yet some 2,000 years later, the majority of mankind have yet so much as to hear the real religion of Jesus. Perhaps they've heard a religion about Jesus, but not the religion of Jesus. And this is a mighty challenge and commission. In 15 out of Jesus' 19 resurrection appearances, he challenged not only his chosen apostles, but his disciples as well, those who were students of his message, but who were not in the apostolic or evangelistic parties. He challenged them in 15 out of 19 resurrection appearances to go, therefore, into all the world and proclaim this gospel of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And yet 2,000 years later, yet not yet has been done. There's a mighty challenge ahead for us. For those of us who have studied and believed and loved this book, mightier things yet to be done. There is a great and a thrilling work for each one of us in this transcendent enterprise of proclaiming spiritual truth. In the last act and final scene of the Lerner and Lowe stage production Camelot, 
King Arthur turns and speaks these ringing words to a young lad, Tom of Warwick, who has come from afar with idealism surging in his soul to serve as a knight of the round table. King Arthur says to him, you will return to your home in England, do you understand? To grow up and grow old. And you will always remember what I, the king, tell you, and you will do as I command, do you understand? And then King Arthur says, each evening from December to December, before you drift to sleep upon your cot, think back on all the tales that you remember of Camelot. Ask every person if he's heard this story and tell it strong and clear if he is not. That once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. And so did Jesus of Nazareth commission each one of us who has heard and believed this gospel he proclaimed to go forth into all the world and proclaim this majestic message of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Ask every person if he's heard the story and tell it strong and clear if he has not. For as the Father sent me into the world, said Jesus, so send I you.